Yes. Good afternoon and uh, uh, good evening as well from many parts of the world. Uh, on behalf of the Institute of the Humanities and Global Cultures at the University of Virginia, a very warm welcome to our audiences um, uh, spread across Virginia, the, the rest of the US and around the world. I'm Devjani Ganguly, a literary historian and the director of the Institute, and have great pleasure in welcoming you and our guest speaker, Amitav Ghosh, to our year-long lecture series on futurities. Our series features humanists, scientists, writers, artists, policy makers, who explore burning questions about our unfolding futures in the age of technological intensification and climate change. Amitav Kosha's talk will be followed by a discussion with Bruce Holsinger, a novelist and a medievalist who holds the Lyndon Kent Memorial Chair in English here at the University of Virginia, where he also serves as editor of the journal New Literary History. Bruce's climate change novel Displacements will be out this July. So over the last half century, predictions of a global environmental catastrophe have loomed, but always far ahead. Future generations are unlikely to condone our lack of prudent concern for the integrity of the natural world that supports all life, wrote Rachel Carson in 1962. The IPCC's megascale models predict irreversible climatic shocks that await us at the end of the century should be failed to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. At the same time, reckoning with global warming and the overshoot of planetary boundaries is to reckon with future reals, both a mode of hyperrealism of what is to come inevitably, irrevocably, and also an acknowledgement that the future is already here. Vistas of future pregnant with promises of infinite growth and human flourishing appear to be vanishing as fast as Arctic ice. What might the limits of our current risk modeling exercises be, frequently predicated as they are on geoengineering marvels and a techno-optimism? How do speculative fiction and films envision the future? What insights do novelists and cultural historians have to offer in helping us think about human life against the vast backdrop of non-human pasts and futures? Our speaker this afternoon is uniquely suited to share his insights on these compelling questions. Amitav Ghosh is easily one of the most outstanding storytellers of a world shaped by the forces of maritime colonialism, including the centuries long opium trade, of fossil fuel capitalism, environmental degradation, and large scale displacements and migrations of our extended modern era. His epic scale polyglossic novels of the world of ordinary men and women caught up in the vortex of history have enthralled readers around the world. Amtav Ghosh has received many prizes and awards in his long and distinguished career, comprising of 10 novels and seven works of nonfiction. In December, 2018, he was awarded India's highest literary honor, the Gyanpeet Award, the first English language author accorded this distinction in the subcontinent. His galvanizing intervention in his 2016 book, The Great Derangement, urged us to confront the fact that, as he put it, the climate crisis is also a crisis of culture and that thus of the imagination. For Amitabh, our insistence on carrying on as normal in the face of the unthinkable is the enabling madness at the center of modernity's addiction to extraction and consumption. At a time when the wild has become the norm, and freak events such as tornadoes, wildfires, and tsunamis are becoming more common. We are suffering acutely from a crisis of imagination in his views. For literary scholars in particular, the great arrangement is a revelation for a sharp indictment of the occlusion of climate upheavals in mainstream realist novels from, 19, from 1750 to the late 20th century. The narrative pleasure compatible with the regularity of everyday bourgeois life of the realist novel, Amitav Kosh notes, deliberately banishes catastrophic scenarios as unmodern and the genres that deal with it to the less hallowed category of science fiction. His latest novel, Gun Island, 
takes up the challenge he offered to literary novelists in the great derangement, that they seriously rethink their realist frames and engage with the uncanny force of the non-human and the larger planetary world in their creative work. The mystery of the Gun Island unfolds in an extraordinary tale of climate upheavals and mass migrations, stretching from the perturbations of the Little Ice Age in the 17th century to a contemporary crisis of climate-induced displacement that by recent estimates from the International Organization for Migration will generate 200 million refugees by 2060. As we continue to encounter what Amitabh Ghosh calls non-human constraints on our carbon fueled worlds, we need a rejuvenated imagination and new aesthetic forms that bring ever more powerfully into view our lived experience of climate change. Few literary voices have been more compelling than Amitabh's in confronting the stark truth that we are already living in the midst of this catastrophe, that it is not an event that will unfold in the future. His idea of the uncanny or the eruption of the earth as a living animate force brings to life a vestigial recognition that we've never existed independently of the non-human. And it is this animist recoil of a planet in distress that shapes his powerful new book, The Nutmeg's Curse. Amitav Ghosh's lecture this afternoon envisions futurity's pasts in a vitalist mode through the story of the humble nutmeg. Taking a nutmeg out of its fruit is like unearthing a tiny planet, he writes. We can hardly wait for his parable to unfold yet again. Amitav, a very warm welcome and look forward to your talk. Thank you very much, Devjani. Thank you for that uh, very kind and generous introduction. <clears throat> so shall I go straight into it? Yes. Uh, so I need to share a screen with you because this is a, uh, this is a, a PowerPoint. Uh, is the screen, is, do you see it? Yes. Yes. It's fine. yes? Great. Yes. So the story of the nutmeg's curse begins almost exactly 400 years ago in a very far away place. So far away that very few of you are likely to have heard of it. That place is the Banda archipelago, a tiny cluster of islands in the far southeastern quadrant of the Indian Ocean. The largest of these islands is only two and a half miles in length and half a mile in width. So minuscule are the Banda Islands that on most maps, they're marked only as a sprinkling of dots. The Banda Islands <coughs> sit upon a fault line where the earth shows itself to be palpably alive. The islands and their volcanoes are the offspring of the ring of fire that runs from Chile in the east to the rim of the Indian Ocean in the west. A still active volcano, Gunung Api of Fire Mountain, uh, towers above the Bandas, its peak perpetually wreathed in plumes of swel swirling cloud and upwelling steam. Gunung Api is one of a great number of volcanoes in this stretch of ocean. The surrounding waters are dotted with beautifully formed conical mountains that surge majestically out of the waves some of them rising to heights of over a thousand meters or more. The very name of the region, Maluku, which gave birth to the English toponym Molakas, is said to derive from Moloko, a word that means uh, mountain or mountain island. The mountain islands of Maluku often erupt with devastating force, yet there is also something magical about these convulsions something akin to the pain of childbirth. For the eruption of Maluku's volcanoes brings to the surface alchemical mixtures of materials which interact with the winds and weather of the region in such a way as to create forests that teem with wonders and rarities. In the case of the Banda Islands, the gift of Gunungapi was a botanical species that has flourished on this tiny archipelago like nowhere else the tree that produces both nutmeg and mace. The nutmeg is a venturesome traveler. How much so is easy to chart, simply because every single nutmeg in the world originated in or around the Bandas before the 18th century. 
So it follows that any mention of the nutmeg in any text anywhere before the 1700s automatically establishes a link with the bandas. In Chinese texts, those mentions date back to the first century before the common era. In European texts, the nutmeg appears a century later, which suggests that it had already been in circulation across Europe, Africa, and Asia from long before that time. Of this, there can be no doubt at any rate that the nutmeg had traveled thousands of miles across the oceans long before the first Europeans reached Maluku. It was these journeys that ultimately brought European navigators to Maluku. They came because plant products like the nutmeg and cloves had already traveled in the other direction long before them. Apart from their culinary uses, nutmegs, cloves, and other spices were valued also for their medical or medicinal properties. In the 16th century, the value of the nutmeg soared when doctors in Elizabethan England decided that the spice could be used to cure the plague, epidemics of which were then sweeping through Eurasia. Nutmegs became so valuable in Europe that a handful could buy a house or a ship. What made the, nut what made the nutmeg and mace the objects of such intense desire? Like many other spices, they have some remarkable properties. But contrary to modern myth, they did not owe their desirability to their preservative powers. The commonest of household ingredients, salt, is actually a far more effective preservative. Why then did these culinary condiments come to be so greatly valued? The answer is simple, because spices connoted luxury, because only the affluent and powerful could afford them. In the late Middle Ages, Nutmegs reached Europe by changing hands many times at many points of transit. The latter stages of their journey took them through Egypt or the Levant to Venice, which ran a tightly controlled monopoly on the European spice trade in the centuries leading up to the voyages of Christopher Columbus and Vasco da Gama. Columbus himself was from Genoa, where Venice's monopoly on the Eastern trade had long been bitterly resented. It was in order to break the Serene Republic's hold on that trade that navigators set off on the journeys that led to the Americas and the Indian Ocean. Among their goals, one of the most important was to find the islands that were home to the nutmeg. The stakes were immense for the navigators and for the monarchs who financed them. The spice race, it has been said, was the space race of its time. <clears throat> The Portuguese were the first Europeans to reach the Banda Islands in 1511, but others followed hot on their heels. First the Spanish, then the Dutch and the English. What the Europeans had in common was that they all wanted to impose a monopoly on the trade in nutmegs and mace. The Dutch were the most relentless of all, sending fleets to the islands again and again with the intention of forcing treaties on the inhabitants. The islanders were few in number. There were only about 15,000 of them altogether, but they resisted so stubbornly that in 1621, the governor general of the Dutch East Indies, Jan Peterson Kuhn, who is remembered today for the coining the aphorism, no war without trade, no trade without war, decided that the Banda problem needed a final solution. The islands needed to be emptied of their inhabitants. Once the Bandanese were gone, settlers and slaves would be brought in to create a new plantation economy in the archipelago. So in February 1621, Kuhn led a Dutch fleet to the Banda Islands and issued orders to the inhabitants to abandon their villages and leave their homes. Naturally, they did not comply. So in April 1620, uh, 1621, Kuhn implemented his final solution. On his orders, in a period of a few weeks, the Dutch effectively eliminated the entire population of the islands. Several were killed, several thousand died of starvation, of disease, and the rest were enslaved and deported. In short, within a few months, the Bandanese, once a proud and enterprising trading community, had ceased to exist as a people. Their world had been brought to an end in a span of less than 10 weeks. The Bandanese were thus among the earliest victims of a scourge that now threatens to engulf the entire planet, the resource curse. How should the story of the nutmeg be told? 
And does it even matter? After all, what happened in the Banda Islands was merely one instance of a history of colonization that was then unfolding on a vastly larger scale on the other side of the earth, in the Americas. It might be said that the page has been turned on that chapter of history, that the 21st century bears no resemblance to that long ago time when plants and botanical matter could decide the fate of human beings. It could be said that humanity has freed itself from the earth and, the, and its soil and is now in an era when human-made goods take precedence over the products of the earth. What possible bearing, bearing it could be asked? Could this centuries old story have on our times? The trouble is that none of the above is true. Humanity is today even more dependent on botanical matter than it was 300 or 500 or even five millennia ago, and not just for food. Most people in the world today are completely dependent in every aspect of their lives on energy that comes from long buried carbon. And what are coal, oil, and natural gas except fossilized forms of botanical matter? The sales of this fossilized botanical matter amount to over $10 trillion annually, and the trading and transporting of fossil fuels generates another $3 trillion. No human-made commodity comes even close to commanding so large a share of global trade and shipping. If anything, it was in the pre-modern era that manufactured goods like textiles and porcelain accounted for a greater share of global trade. The truth is that human beings have never been more dependent on the Earth's provisions, botanical matter most of all, than they are today. The idea that modern man has freed himself from the planet is not just absurd, it is a dangerous illusion. Once the reality of humanity's ever-increasing servitude to the Earth is acknowledged, the story of the Bandanese no longer seems so distant from our present predicament. To the contrary, the continuities between the two are so pressing and powerful that it could even be said that the fate of the Banda Islands might be read as a template for the present, if only we knew how to tell that story. <coughs> The horror of the story of the Bandanese lies in no small part in the fact that the narrative of their elimination from their land revolves around a tree, a species of incomparable value gifted to the islanders by the region's volcanic ecology. Yet what can be said about the role of the nutmeg, uh, nutmeg tree in this story? It is certainly true that the history of the archipelago cannot be narrated without reference to the tree, but it cannot, for that reason, be said that the tree authored or decided the fate of the Bandanese. For the Bandanese, uh, literally the nutmeg tree was a tree of life. It made them rich and prosperous uh, for, th um, for more than a thousand years, definitely. So these questions, how do we tell the story of the, Ban uh, of the Bandanese? These questions, how do we tell the story of the Bandanese and their relationship with their tree of life? Once we ask these questions, we are brought to the limits of a certain way of telling stories about the past. The empirical documentary methods of historical scholarship depend critically on language, literacy, and writing. Its evidence comes primarily from written records. In the stories it tells, entities that lack language figure only as backdrops against which human dramas are enacted. Nutmegs, cloves, and volcanoes may figure in these stories, but they cannot themselves be actors in the stories that historians tell, nor can they tell stories of their own. For Malukans, on the other hand, as for many others who live in seismic zones, trees, flowers, and volcanoes are makers of history as well as tellers of stories. For the Bandanese, the landscapes, forests, and trees of their islands were places of dwelling that were enmeshed with human life in ways that were imaginative as well as material. The landscape did not exist solely to produce nutmeg. They sang songs about nutmegs and volcanoes and told stories about them. For Jan Kuhn and the, and the Dutch East India Company, on the other hand, the trees, volcanoes, and landscapes of the Bandas had no meaning except as resources that could be harnessed to generate profit. For them, the trees and volcanoes that were woven into the songs of the Bandanese 
contained nothing in excess of their utility. The idea that a volcano could make meaning would have been for them merely superstition or even idolatry. Nor in the eyes of, the, uh, of Dutch colonists was there any intrinsic connection between the Bandanese and the landscape they, in they inhabited. They could simply be replaced by workers and managers who would transform their archipelago into a nutmeg producing factory. This was a radically new way of envisioning the earth as a vast machine made of iner inert particles in ceaseless motion. Even in Europe, the, uh, the mechanistic vision of the world had only just begun to take shape in the 17th century, and then too only among elites. The fact that it happened against the backdrop of the European conquest of the Americas was not coincidental. It was in the wake of the subjugation of those continents that educated upper-class European men began to think of themselves as the subduers of all they surveyed, even in their own countries and especially within that domain they conceived of as nature, an inert repository of resources, which in order to be improved, needed to be expropriated, no matter whether from Amerindians or European peasants. But this conception of nature did not apply only to non-human resources. People like Amerindians, Africans, Asians, were similarly thought to belong to nature and were therefore also thought to be eligible for appropriation and enslavement or even extermination, as was the case with the Bandanese. Just like non-human resources, these humans too were regarded as, as mute, brutish, and devoid of agency. Today, not even the most diehard positivist or mechanist would claim, at least explicitly, that there exists any category of humans who are mute or devoid of agency. But what about non-humans? There are many people in the world and many, if not most of them perhaps, are indigenous, who continue to believe that plants, trees, animals, and even geological features are neither mute nor lacking in agency. But very few of these, uh, of these people belong to dominant global elites, and even fewer are located within the academy. For historians, economists, and other academics, non-human entities are still seen as inert and incapable of agency. In that sense, their way of enframing the world is still very much founded on the ideologies that rose to dominance in the wake of European empires in the 17th century. <clears throat> One notable feature of these ideologies is that they were radically centered on humanity. Human beings were regarded as being exalted over all other creatures and the principal mark of their superiority lay in their possession of language and in their ability to make and understand meaningful statements. Within this view, only humans possessed the ability to speak, to act intentionally, and not least to make history. These views were, it should be noted, largely held by elite European men. Across the planet, there were always many, many people who believed and still do that there exist some or many kinds of beings who can and do speak. Nor are these views held only by non-Westerners. Even in Europe and other parts of the West, there have always existed many people who believed that humans were not the only beings endowed with souls and the capacity to make and understand meaning. But such people were regarded by elite Westerners as superstitious and deluded primitives and animists. To be civilized was to accept that the earth is inert and machine-like and that no aspect of it in principle can elude human knowledge. Indeed, the very idea that other than human beings had souls or could speak was regarded as a sign of savagery that needed to be suppressed or eradicated with extreme violence if necessary. So to this day, it is taken for granted by many, if not most educated people, that a question like, can non-humans speak, is ipso facto absurd. Yet the matter is not as easily settled as it may at first appear. But the question, can non-humans speak, conjures up a number of other queries. For example, can all humans speak? The answer is clearly no, because there are many beings who are indisputably human, but who for reasons of disability, age, mental condition, and so on, cannot speak. <clears throat> 
Conversely, it is also true that a person who is unable to use language does not, for that reason, cease to be a human being. Similarly, we might ask, who are the humans who speak? What, for example, is the process of elimination that allows me to speak today rather than, say, a, a taxi driver? The moment we ask this question, it becomes evident that the act of speak, speaking is also an act of silencing or privileging some forms of communication over others. Yet another fundamental question that arises in this regard is who and what is human? Today, the definition of human is often tied to the binomial name Homo sapiens, the wise ape, a taxonomic category that was invented by Linnaeus in 1758. The date tells us a great deal about the phrase Homo sapiens. For, exa for example, it tells us that it was born of the European Enlightenment amidst the emergence of what we now regard as science. According to the Linnaean definition, all members of the class Homo sapiens are a single species. Yet Linnaeus also divided the species into various subspecies, according to geography and physical attributes. In other words, even as the Enlightenment was producing the idea of the human as a single species, it was also negating that idea. Hence, many, if not most Enlightenment philosophers believed that there existed a natural hierarchy within the species Homo sapiens, so that some races and classes were more human than others. We cannot forget that the new, that the new world, for example, was represented by its European conquerors as a, quote, world without humans. And that it was this that allowed them to attempt the mass extermination of indigenous peoples. But as, Danaus as Danowski and Viveros de, Ca de Castro have pointed out, that it was, I quote, the genocide of American peoples, Amerindian peoples, that was the beginning of the modern world for Europe. Without the despoiling of the Americas, Europe would never have become more than the backyard of Eurasia, the home continent of civilizations that were much richer. No pillage of the Americas, no capitalism, no industrial revolution, thus perhaps no Anthropocene either. Equally, from the Amerindian point of view, the end of their world could be seen to be the result of an invasion by a species disguised as humans. So we are confronted with the paradox that the invention of the human went hand in hand with the process of disaggregation, whereby the faculties of speech and reasoning were not regarded as being distributed equally among all humans. Needless to add, these beliefs held powerful sway through much of the 19th and 20th centuries and are with us even today in vestigial forms, for example, in development studies and various kinds of uh, fields like that. Let us consider for a moment a contrary possibility, one in which living things of many kinds are able, if not to speak, then at least to articulate certain aspects of their being. This is not, excuse me. This is not a far-fetched idea. We now know that, a forest, that trees in a forest are able to communicate with each other in certain circumstances. They can send help in the form of carbon to ailing members of their group, and they can warn each other about pestilence and disease. It is now thought that certain plants can even emit sounds that are inaudible to the human ear, but are audible to some other living things. This suggests that one problem with the question, can the non-human speak, lies in its wording which rests on a term speak that is pinned to language, a human attribute. In that they lack this attribute, trees could be said to be mute. But in that we lack the ability to communicate as trees do, could it not be said that for a tree, it is the human who is mute? So whose definition prevails? The answer to this again is far from obvious. It may seem to us that because we have the ability to chop down a tree, that it is we who decide who speaks and who is mute. But many trees have much longer lifespans than human beings. Some live for over a thousand years. If indeed trees possessed ways of reasoning, we can be sure that they would be calibrated to a completely different time scale, perhaps one in which humans may go extinct or experience catastrophic mortality events. Such a world would be one in which trees could flourish as never before, on soil that will have been enriched by billions of decomposing human bodies. So 
it may appear self-evident to us that we are the gardeners who, who get to decide what happens to trees. Yet, from a different start time scale, it might appear equally evident that it is the trees who are gardening us. But perhaps this is all wrong. After all, trees and human beings are not, or not just, adversaries competing for space. They are also linked by innumerable forms of cooperation. Perhaps what is at fault here is the very idea of a single species. We know now that the human body contains vast numbers of microorganisms of various kinds. We know that we could not function without their presence. We know that microorganisms influence our moods, emotions, and ability to reason. So if it is true that the human ability to speak can only be actualized in the presence of other species, can it really be said that the faculty of speech is exclusive to, hum to human beings? As Anat Singh points out in her brilliant book, The Mushroom at the End of the World, it seems increasingly that species do not evolve singly, but rather in close intimacy with other organisms. She cites the example of certain animals that are only able to develop fully when they encounter certain specific microorganisms that are not a part of their own genetic makeup. These animals must encounter those bacteria in the world. That is, they must encounter those, uh, those uh, other creatures uh, historically. It, within history. Without those encounters, they're unable to fully realize their potential. But could it not also be said of humans too that the presence of certain other species in specific moments of encounter enable them to transcend their own limitations? Consider one landmark moment in the history of human consciousness, the enlightenment of the Buddha. This event occurred while the Buddha was meditating under a Bodhi tree. Within the Buddhist tradition for more than 2000 years, the presence of this tree has been inseparable from that moment. This is not to say that the tree transmits illumination or even that it is an active participant in the process. Nor is it at all the case that everyone who meditates under a Bodhi tree will achieve enlightenment. Yet it has long been accepted by many millions of people that a trans species encounter at a specific historical juncture was essential to the enlightenment of one particular human, Prince Siddhartha Gautama. And the Buddha himself believed the tree to be essential to his attainment of Nibbana, which is why millions of Buddhists consider the Bodhi tree to be sacred to this day. What does this tell us? It tells us, first of all, that certain kinds of trans-species associations cannot be approached as though they were processes or relationships. They are precisely encounters or events that occur at specific moments in time and are not repeatable. This means that such encounters can only be approached historically by attending to the circumstances in which they occur. Secondly, it tells us that an awareness of the possibilities of trans-species encounters of this sort has always existed among humans. For we need only think of the traditions that surround St. Francis of Assisi to recognize that there are many other examples of such associations. So the true question then is not whether the non-human can speak, but rather when and how did some humans and let it be noted that these humans are mainly people with university educations. How did these humans come to believe that other species are essentially brutes, incapable of articulation and agency? <clears throat> Literature's best known brute is of course, Shakespeare's Caliban, who makes his entrance in The Tempest which is famously an, an allegory of colonialism. And it, uh, strangely enough, it was written at almost the same time uh, as the Banda genocide. The name Caliban is probably an anagram for cannibal, a word which would originally have referred to a group of Amerindians. Because of the affinity between L, N, and R, the tribe has been referred to as Calib, Carib, and Canib. In the Tempest's Dramatis Personae, Caliban is listed as a savage and deformed slave. And the grotesqueness of his appearance is a recurrent theme in the play. Yet the essence of Caliban's brutishness does not lie in his external appearance, 
That is indeed the importance of the famous lines in which Prospero reminds Caliban of the most important gift that he has given him. I pitied thee, took pains to make thee speak, taught thee each hour, one thing or other. When thou didst not, savage, know thine own meaning, but wouldst gabble like a thing most brutish. I endowed thy purposes with words that made them known. The essence of Cal Caliban's brutishness lies then in his lack of language, in his inability to make meaning, even though he possesses the faculty of speech. Prospero's words, I endowed thy purposes with words that made them known, go straight to the heart of the European colonizers framing of the colonized. Despite possessing the uniquely human faculty of speech, brutish humans cannot produce meaning. Their sounds amount to mere gabble until the colonizer gives them words, which endows them at last with the ability to make meaning. Until then, no matter that they have tongues, voices, and languages, brutes are effectively mute, like nature itself, which also makes sounds, but produces no meaning. In this view of the world, the sounds of nature are not equivalent to utterances. They are the products of mechanical responses and reactions. The muteness of nature and the muteness of the brute are thus reflections of each other. As a process then, the muting of a large part of humanity by European colonizers cannot be separated from the simultaneous muting of nature. Uh, in the words of the historian Joyce Chaplin, demystifying nature, displaying bodily strength and using technology all became measures of colonial power." Unquote. Colonization was thus not merely a process of establishing dominion over human beings, it was also a process of subjugating and reducing to muteness an entire universe of beings that was once thought of as having agency, powers of communication, and the ability to make meaning. These included animals, trees, volcanoes, nutmegs. There are few more poignant accounts of this process of, of dual muting of colonized humans as well as non-humans than the words of walking buffalo, a stony Indian from Canada. Quote, did you know that trees talk? Well, they do. They talk to each other and they'll talk to you if you listen. Trouble is white people don't listen. They never learn to listen to the Indians. So I don't suppose they listen to other voices in nature, unquote. These mutings were essential to the process of establishing Western rule over the earth. Because as the philosopher Akil Bilgrani observes, in order to see something as a mere resource, we first need to see it as brute, as something that makes no normative demands of practical and moral engagement with us. It is by rendering a vast continuum of human and non-human beings into brutes that the colonizer turns them into resources to be used as slaves, servants, and commodities. This entire continuum was also believed to be subject to the natural laws that condemn certain species to extinction or extermination. <clears throat> the questions of who is a brute and who is fully human, who makes meaning and who does not, who speaks and who is mute, lie at the core of the planetary crisis. At this moment, when we look back on the trajectory that has brought us to the brink of a planetary catastrophe, we cannot but recognize that our plight is a consequence of the ways in which certain classes of humans, a small minority in fact, have actively muted others by representing them as brutes, creatures whose presence on earth is solely material. It was because of these assumptions that it was taken for granted that the greater part of humanity was intellectually and culturally incapable of industrializing. And that delusion is itself an essential component of the catastrophe that is now unfolding across the planet. Would the West have embarked on its reckless use of resources if it had imagined that a day might come when the rest of the world would adopt those very practices, just as the West had itself adopted innumerable non-Western practices and technologies? 
If this possibility had been acknowledged a century ago, then maybe some thought would have been given to the consequences. But through the 19th and much of the 20th centuries, it was an unstated assumption among those who ruled the world that most non-Westerners were simply too stupid, too brutish to make the transition to industrial civilization on a mass scale. Concealed by abstractions, these assumptions undergirded a range of academic disciplines, like development studies and some branches of economics and sociology, in which poverty was ascribed to culture, a term that was often freighted with racial baggage. It is perhaps only in the last two or three decades that the West has awakened to something that it had not imagined possible, that the non-West is fully capable of adopting extractive carbon intensive technologies and all that goes with them, like scientific and technological research and certain genres of art and literature. Had it been acknowledged earlier that human beings are and have always been essentially mimetic creatures perfectly capable of learning from each other, then perhaps sustainability would, become, would have become an urgent issue much earlier. But this possibility was precluded by long held assumptions until the brutes began to unbrute themselves. The terrible irony is that the unbruting of the middle classes of the non-West was achieved precisely by repeating and even intensifying the processes of brutalization that were set in motion by Europe's colonial conquests. In India over the last three decades, the beliefs, practices and livelihoods of forest peoples have come under attack as never before. In hideous mimicries of the settler colonial treatment of indigenous peoples, more and more forest areas have been opened up to the mining and tourism industries, sometimes with the support of exclusionary conservationists who advocate the removal of forest dwellers in the name of uh, ecology. Forest people's sacred mountains have been desecrated, the lands have been swamped by dams, and the beliefs and rituals have come under attack as primitive superstitions exactly the terms that were once used by colonial administrators, scientists, and missionaries. The replication of colonial practices extends even to the removing, uh, to the removing of tribal children to boarding schools. Similar processes are underway also in China in relation to the Uyghur and in Indonesia in relation to Papuans. The difference is that these mimicries of colonial brutalization have unfolded not over centuries, but in a few decades going back to 1990. No less than half the greenhouse gases that are now in the atmosphere were actually emitted in the last 30 years. It is the tremendous acceleration brought about by the worldwide adoption of colonial methods of extra extraction and consumption that has thrust us to the edge of the precipice. This compressed time frame has however seen to it that non-humans too are no longer as mute as they once were. Other beings and forces, bacteria, viruses, glaciers, forests, the jet stream, now thrust themselves so exigently on our attention that we have had to recognize that we are no longer in the world of Galileo, where objects were placed beside each other without affecting each other. We are now in Gaia, which is, as Bruno Latour has pointed out, a world of agents constantly interacting with each other. Everything we experience on earth is the unforeseen, secondary and involuntary effect of the action of living organisms. An essential step towards the silencing of non-human voices was to imagine that only humans are capable of telling stories. This again is not an idea that people have always subscribed to. Many, perhaps most of the world's people still don't. It is essentially another elite idea that gained ground with the onward march of the mechanistic metaphysic. Yet today, the idea that humans are the only storytelling animals appears self-evident to those who subscribe to it. Consider, for instance, this passage from one of the finest portrayals of a landscape in contemporary literature. Graham Swift's superb 1983 novel, Waterland. One of, Graham, uh, one of Swift's characters says, I quote, only animals, only animals uh, live entirely in the here and now. Only nature knows neither memory nor history. But man, let me offer you a definition, is the storytelling animal. <laughs> 
Wherever he goes, he wants to leave behind, not a chaotic wake, not an empty space, but the comforting marker buoys and trail signs of stories." Unquote. This passage serves as the epigraph for a fine article by the environmental historian, William Cronon. The article is on the nature of narrative and Cronon argues that the fundamental difference between a mere succession of events, which he calls a chronology, and the story is that the latter joins events together in ways uh, that invests them with meaning. This, he assumes, is a specifically human ability. So, I quote, narrative is a peculiarly human way of organizing reality, unquote. So once again, what is really at stake is not so much storytelling itself, but rather the question of who can make meaning. Once again, the assumption is that non-humans cannot make or discern meaning. As with so many other attempts to define the exceptionalism of human beings, this idea is tenable only if meaning making and storytelling are defined in a circular fashion as being tied to human forms of language. But is it really the case that experiences cannot have any meaning in the absence of language? Clearly, this does not obtain for pre-linguistic humans. It is well known that even infants understand and make many kinds of meaning. So why should it not be possible to connect experiences into meaningful patterns in other ways, through memory, sight, or smell, for instance? Any pet owner knows that a dog understa understands as meaningful the relationship between the home, the park, and certain times of day. For the dog, is this a chronology or a narrative? Either way, it is clearly not the case that the dog lives entirely in the here and now. Its experiences are sequential and are understood to unfold in time and space. The importance of sequencing will be evident to anyone who has ever tried to write a story. A narrative is nothing if not an arrangement of a sequence of events. This is why the sentences that connect one paragraph to another are of such vital importance. They provide the sequential connections between events and places out of which a meaningful narrative emerges. This kind of narrative sequencing is analogous to movement through time as well as space. That is exactly what is meant by the unfolding of a story. That may account for why so many of the world's earliest and most powerful narratives are stories that unfold through movement. For example, the Ramayan, the Odyssey, the Norse sagas, the journey to the West and so on. It is well established now that many animals have long memories and are able to communicate in complex ways. Some of these animals like elephants, whales and migratory birds also move over immense distances and appear to have attachments to particular places. These movements cannot be described as purely mechanical, instinctive, or lacking in meaningful sequences. Humpback whales, for instance, mark the passage of time by changing their songs from year to year. This would hardly be possible if they lived entirely in the here and now. As far back a German, as the 1930s, uh, a German biologist whose name I can never pronounce, demonstrated that many animals actively interpret their surroundings, creating their own experiential worlds. This idea has long been anathema to those who believe that it's a cardinal error to attribute human qualities to animals. But as Eileen Christ has so uh, persuasively shown in her book, Image of, Im Images of Animals, Anthropomorphism and Animal Mind, uh, to rigorously avoid anthropomorphism is only to risk falling into the related uh, fallacy of mechanomorphism, the assumption that animals are machine-like creatures that cannot, in principle, be endowed with minds or interpretive faculties. In short, there are many good reasons to conclude, as Donna Haraway does, that, I quote, story cannot any longer be put into the box of human exceptionalism. Unquote. The anthrop anthropologist Tom Van Duren goes further. In a fascinating study of a flock of penguins who doggedly return year after year to the shores of a Sydney suburb, he concludes that the bird's attachment to the place arises out of story. He writes, I quote, experiencing beings like penguins represent the world to themselves too. They do not just take in sensory data as unfiltered and meaningless phenomena. 
but weave meaning out of experiences so that they, like humans, inhabit an endlessly storied world. It would seem then that the idea that humans are the only storytelling animal is by no means an unproblematic reflection of reality. It is something that some people like to believe, just as some once believed that most humans were brutes and thus incapable of making meaning. It is, in other words, a construct, one that is intimately connected with structures of power and with the forceful repression of the awareness of non-human forms of agency and expression. Not surprisingly, in this matter too, the hand of power has often fallen hardest on indigenous people. When we think of the suppression of stories today, our minds leap immediately to dissident literature and authoritarian regimes. Yet there were other kinds of stories that were also suppressed or repressed for quite different reasons over much longer spans of time. For example, the Hamaha narratives of the Laguna Pueblo. In Leslie Mar Marmon Silko's words, these stories uh, are about the conversations that coyotes, crows, and buzzards used to have with human beings. In her memoir, The Turquoise Ledge, Silko recalls how in her childhood, Hamaha stories could not be mentioned in certain public spaces because they revealed, I quote, the Laguna spiritual outlook towards animals, plants, and spirit beings, unquote. The stories existed in the shadows as a secret law. It is perfectly possible then that far from being an exclusively human attribute, the narrative faculty is the most animal of human abilities, a product of one of the traits that humans indisputably share with animals and many other beings, that is attachments to place. Perhaps then storytelling far from setting humans apart from animals is actually the most important residue of our formerly wild selves. This would explain why stories, above all, are quintessentially the domain of human imaginative life, in which non-humans had voices, and where non-human agency was fully recognized and even celebrated. To make this leap may be difficult in other, more prosaic domains of thought, but it was by no means a stretch in the world of storytelling, where anything is possible. The shrinking of the possibilities of this domain and the consequent erasure of non-human voices from so-called serious literature has played no small part in creating that blindness to other beings that is so marked a feature of official modernity. It follows then that if those non-human voices are, are to be restored to their proper place, then it must be in the first instance through the medium of stories. This is the great burden that now rests upon writers, artists, filmmakers, and everyone else who is involved in the telling of stories. To us falls the task of imaginatively restoring agency and voice to non-humans. As with all the most important artistic endeavors in human history, this is a task that is at once aesthetic and political. And because of the magnitude of the crisis that besets the planet, it is now freighted with the most pressing moral urgency. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Amitabh, for that extraordinarily rich um, talk. Let me, let me enable my video. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Amitabh, for that extraordinarily rich and moving um, talk that, that just kind of travels the arc of human history. Um, in, in, in ways that, um, yeah, uh, just just make us just feel the sheer inadequacy in many ways of some of the modes of knowledge that we pursue in our everyday lives. And, uh, and with that, uh, I will uh, invite uh, our uh, discussant, uh, Bruce Holzinger, uh, to um, share his thoughts about Amitav's work and his talk and uh, and advanced uh, uh, after about 15 minutes or so, we'll take questions from the audience. Over to you, Bruce. Great, thank you. And thank you, Deb Johnny, for the invitation um, to, to talk with Amitav about this, this book. And Amitav, thank you for this book and that, that wonderful presentation. Um, I wanted to start, I think, just with, with the book's title. So for those of you who haven't seen it, um, The Nutmeg's Curse, Parables for a Planet in Crisis. And that word parable really struck me and I was, hoping we could start there. Um, one of the early questions in your talk was how should the story of the nutmeg be told? 
Um, and that how I think is, is really provocative and you trace it out in so many different ways um, over the course of the many chapters. Um, and, but the way that you tell that story um, as, as a series of parables, you've written in so many genres and modes over your career, um, anthropology, uh, fiction writing, travel writing, literary critique. In fact, I first read your work and came across your work um, in the journal Subaltern Studies. Um, it was a piece from, I think, 1994, 95, on a 12th century manuscript from the uh, Ben Ezra Geniza, that, uh, the slave of manuscript H6, and that became um, the inspiration for your book um, in an antique land. Um, so, you know, I've, I've encountered your work in so many different ways, but I would, I would love to hear you talk a little bit about um, what compels you about the power of the parable, why that became the model for this latest book. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you very much for that question. Um, you know, in my, uh, in my 2016 book, The Great Derangement, uh, I talk about how we need to find uh, uh, new modes of storytelling, new forms, uh, because uh, the old forms, the forms that were really born uh, in high modernity, you know, over the 19th century and 20th century, uh, these forms are really so tied to a certain way of life uh, that they really cannot tell the stories of our time. And we really see that uh, unfolding in front of our eyes right now. So I said there that, you know, we have to look for new forms like uh, myths, parables, and so on. Of course, uh, I, I understand that to the Western mind, uh, the word parable really uh, conjures up uh, the uh, biblical scripture, you know, where parables play such an important part. And I'm not trying to sort of separate my conception of the parable from that. But I think what I was trying to gesture at uh, with the use of that word here is that the structure of my book is essentially parabolic, uh, you know, uh, in it's, uh, it's fractal, so to speak. I mean, it doesn't follow any kind of continuous uh, narrative. Uh, and I think this is what happens when you take uh, uh, not, uh, not time, but space uh, as your guide, you know. And here I, fe I felt very much uh, uh, enriched by the example of Sven Lindqvist and his book, Exterminate All the Brutes, which similarly, you know, maps ideas onto uh, particular spaces. And also by the work of uh, uh, an amazing uh, young American writer, uh, Ben Ehrenreich, who wrote a book called Desert Notebooks, uh, a really, really remarkable work of uh, nonfiction uh, about the Southwestern desert. Well, again, he does the same, uh, he, he does something similar. So uh, yes, I mean, it's in that sense that I was using the word parable. Yeah. Well, I was thinking even, you know, you brought up scriptural parallel, uh, parables, but even there in that tradition, you know, they, a lot of the parables in the, um, the Hebrew Bible and in the New Testament are drawing on that kind of vitalist um, sort of animation of the non-human world. They are, you know, thinking of the parable of the weeds, the, um, the mustard seed, right? There's a parable of the yeast. Um, so there, there's that, that kind of vitalism, even in those parables. So it may be that that tradition gives us a way of storytelling that that is thinking about um, animism in the way that, that, or vitalism rather, in, in the ways that you're, you're trying to locate that in, in the book. Yes, it's often been pointed out that the Old Testament in particular has many uh, vitalist elements, you know, and that it's very responsive and attentive to uh, climate um, and the atmosphere and to the land and so on. I think that really begins to fade. Uh, all those traditions really begin to fade uh, with the Re with the Reformation. Uh, you know, with a certain kind of uh, Protestant approach to uh, uh, these issues. When you know you have the idea, which I always find kind of so intriguing, of the Deus absconditus. You know, the absconding God. I mean, who is utterly removed from any kind of uh, human appeal. Uh, so, yeah, I think these things, are, you know, those are sort of interlinked aspects of modernity that evolve uh, actually fairly recently. Hmm. Another uh, keyword for you in this book is, um, that I didn't hear come up more than once or twice in your, in your talk, is terraforming, um, hmm. which is that this, there's a couple of chapters in here that are that are about that that concept, and you know we're used to thinking of 
We we hear that um, in you know speculative fiction, for example, um, the series The Expanse, where Mars is being terraformed so it looks more like Earth, um, just as settlers would terraform the Americas to look more like Europe. You make that that point in the book, um, and you use the term to talk about a process of remaking the world through massive ecological violence. Um, you know, deeply tied to the histories of colonialism and imperialism. Um, and terraforming, as you describe it, it has huge implications or, and will have even more for the impacts of, of climate change. You know, how much South Florida is terraformed or California, Bangladesh, um, Australia. So uh, what's, what draws you to that term, um, you know, which I know has a lot of, you know, you hear Peter Thiel talking about, you know, billionaires talking about terraforming um, and, you know, as, as a solution to climate catastrophe. Um, but you say that it also has a very long past, and we need to be mindful of that. Oh, yes, very much so. And it's so interesting that the actual term terraforming uh, didn't come into existence uh, until well, the 1940s. And I think it couldn't come into existence because it, 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 it was, as, as it were, a repressed memory, you know, uh, for settler colonial civilizations, because this is exactly what they had done. I mean, they had come and, uh, you know, uh, taken uh, um, a landscape that that had evolved in a in a different direction, and they terraformed it uh, to make it po possible to sustain basically European lifestyles. Uh, you know, and uh, you know it's so interesting how deep uh, this idea uh, is within, uh, especially the science fictional imaginary. So much of science fiction especially I think science fiction written by men is fundamentally uh, based on colonial ideas. Uh, you know, uh, this is not at all the case uh, with Octavia Butler, for example, and some other uh, women writers, most of all, but it certainly is the case with, uh, let's say, A.G. Wells. I mean, after all, War of the Worlds is entirely a story that's based upon the premise of terraforming. You know, the, uh, the predatory alien is coming to, uh, to kill everybody and, uh, you know, turn the, turn the planet into their planet. I mean, the idea is so completely borrowed. Uh, I mean, it's kind of hilarious almost. I mean, I was told that uh, this uh, uh, Wells got, got this idea actually from something that, uh, from Tasmania, yeah, from the extermination of the indigenous peoples of Tasmania. Yeah, but... Uh, uh, so, you know, human beings have always enormously impacted their environments, you know, everywhere they've been. I mean, the Amazon is really the product. I mean, it's, it's, it's a garden really created by uh, nine, 10 million people that it sustained once upon a time. The difference is that I think uh, before uh, uh, the, uh, the European conquest of the Americas, the terraforming that occurred was really a kind of dyadic relationship between uh, humans and uh, the particularities of the environment that they were specifically in. What changes with the, uh, with the colonial conquest of the Americas is that it becomes a triadic relationship uh, because the humans that are here uh, are not evolving, uh, you know, their uh, modus vivendi with, uh, 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 with what's around them. They are actually actively trying to recreate the mother country. They're trying to recreate England, uh, most of all, but also Europe uh, within, uh, um, within the Americas. And this is an absolutely self-conscious project that they launch upon. And it's interesting to see, uh, and, you know, so many great uh, environmental historians have written about, especially the environmental history of, uh, um, of Northeastern America, like Cronin, for example, many others. But it's always, uh, it seems strange to me in retrospect that they never draw this, this particular connection, you know, uh, that is how this land is being remade in the image of another and what the consequences might be. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what we see now, you know, that the land uh, in effect uh, is coming alive in ways as if to shake off uh, the, uh, the new forms that were imposed upon it. Because it's, uh, it seems to me increasingly clear that, you know, contrary to what's often said about the impacts of climate change, uh, where they're going to be felt the most are those parts of the world that have been most extensively terraformed. I think there's a good argument to be made that actually the country that's 
most impacted by climate change is the United States. And it, particularly those parts of the United States that have been most extensively terraformed. Uh, you take, um, uh, let's say California, you know, uh, you take uh, the uh, Louisiana uh, uh, estuary, you know, uh, it's really as if all those forms that were imposed upon it uh, through engineering, which was once thought to be such a great idea, are now unraveling. But this is also true uh, within Europe. Uh, you know, the, uh, the Po Delta is literally coming undone uh, as we speak. I mean, way back, even in the 1950s, they had this catastrophic flooding, uh, which displaced uh, in, a, in a region called Po Lesine, uh, where uh, 250,000 people were displaced. You know, they became environmental refugees. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, we are seeing this unfolding uh, um, around the world, really. Yeah, and you, you know, you talk about the, the past of terraforming, the, the present of terraforming. I almost don't want to ask you about the future of it. It's hard to predict, but you're already seeing all these, um, you know, projections of, you know, it, it might be inevitable that we release sulfur dioxide particles into the air and that we try to, um, you know, terraform the, uh, re-terraform by, you know, seeding the sky so that, that you know, it's not only about what's what's going on with the earth, but about you know reshaping, um, you know the, the the stratosphere. Look, the disasters that are unfolding around us today are so much uh, the unintended consequences of technology. You know, so much the unintended consequences of engineering. I mean, it was once thought that it was a great idea, you know, to dam all the rivers of here and there. Now, now we see that it wasn't such a great idea after all. In fact, it, it yeah. is catastrophic. And that's not just here, it's also uh, in India, you know, we see that uh, these disasters are unfolding all around us. And it's so strange that people are unable to draw the necessary conclusions from this. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the unintended consequences is, is what get you. You know, and uh, I remember hearing uh, the chief sort of, pro, you know, pro advocate of solar geoengineering speaking once and talking about how he, his great thing is that he wants to inject uh, sulfur, uh, what is it, sulfuric acid <laughs> into the other. Sulfur dioxide acid. particles, I think. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, I think he actually said sulfuric acid. <laughs> oh, maybe they're, they're somehow connected. I don't, I don't remember. If it rains, uh, but, it becomes sulfuric acid. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so really, uh, what could go wrong? Just yeah. tell yourself, you know, what does, <laughs> what does sulfur smell like? Sulfur is yeah. the devil. <laughs> the good Do you reason. think one of the... Do you think one of the issues is that the kind of siloing of expertise? You know, you're you were just talking about um, environmental historians. I know in this book, you're you know to to place this history in a longer view. You're looking at paleoclimatology and environmental history. Um, on the back of your book, Naomi Klein has this wonderful endorsement um, about your work. She says it eschews the leaden language of climate expertise, and I wonder if you, as a, as a polymath of sorts, if you could talk about that problem of expertise. Um, I know you cite um, Robin Wall Kimmerer's braiding sweetgrass, which uh, has a lot to say about what counts as expertise, how it needs to be redefined in the context of ecological crisis. For example, in her case, how indigenous knowledges are their own modes of expertise that can help um, push back, I guess, as, as you call it, uh, against um, you know, epistemology is founded on and dependent on extraction. Um, so what about that, that problem of expertise and how have you encountered it as you, um, you know, started writing more and more about ecological crisis? Well, the first thing is that, you know, the whole issue of climate change uh, uh, is almost always framed in relation to expertise. So, you know, all that's written, or let's say, I think probably 80 or 90 percent of what's written about it comes out of uh, uh, Western universities and think tanks and so on. And these are, by definition, uh, elite groups. You know, so all that knowledge is actually produced by Western elites. And uh, uh, it's certainly one of the chief limitations of this, um, that, you know, other points of view are so rarely incorporated into it. There's so many so many kinds of voices are just excluded from uh, from the discussion. And I think that is actually one of the catastrophic effects of this. And uh, even more than that, I'm sure uh, you've seen this, that many people just don't want to talk about climate change because they feel that they have to be able to cite all the numbers and this and that. Mm -hmm. 
And all of this results exactly from the siloing that you mentioned, which is the idea that this is something uh, radically new, that nothing, uh, that there's a big line between this, uh, this moment in history and all other moments. But I, I think it can be, what I'm trying to do in the book is to show that in fact, uh, of course, I mean, the impacts have increased uh, very much more since over the last 30 years, but all of this arises out of the history and uh, out of historical context. So it's very important uh, to recognize that, I think. You know, and it struck me too that the, um, the history you're writing is also a history of emotion around climate change. And it, you know, it, that's just a field I've been interested in, but there's so much in the book that speaks to that. Um, uh, there's a wonderful passage on page 77. You're characterizing the viewpoint of the conqueror. Um, you write, what the earth is really exhausted of is not its resources, what it has lost is meaning. Again, in, in, in the view that you're characterizing, conquered, inert, supine, the earth can no longer ennoble, nor delight, nor produce new aspirations. All it can inspire in its would-be conqueror's mind is the kind of contempt that rises from familiarity. Over time, this contempt has come to be planted so deep within cultures of modernity that it has become a part of its unseen foundation. Um, and then elsewhere you write, um, you have this wonderful discussion of the emotional power of the water wheel versus the steam engine. Um, and you, you suggest, and here I think you're setting a historian, um, you, you talk about the emotional energy from which steam power users were entirely free as opposed to the users of water power. And I thought that was fascinating <clears throat> to think about the, the emotional tenor of different kinds of technologies and, and their, their connective power or their kind of emotional disaggregation of those who are using it? Uh, well, actually that uh, uh, from, comes from the work of Andreas Malm, uh, you know, the historian and activist. And uh, he's, a, he's a very interesting uh, mind, I think. Uh, uh, I, I don't share most of his ideas, but I find his work uh, very, uh, uh, very fruitful and interesting, and especially his work on energy. And this is what he points out, that the reason in the end why fossil fuels won out over, let's say, uh, wind technology, uh, <clears throat> water technologies, was just that they could be expropriated. They reinforced the power of the owner. They reinforced the power of the mill owner. Because if you think back to it, you know, through this entire period of the Industrial Revolution from about in, uh, 1750 to 1850, the dominant form of energy was in fact, uh, was in fact uh, water. So if you, if you go around uh, you know, New England, there are so many textile factories which, are, uh, which actually still have their, uh, their water works right, uh, 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 right beside them. It's wonderful to see, in fact. All these technologies were there and wind technologies were emerging in the late, uh, in the late 19th century. I mean, so many um, early, uh, early buses were electric. You know, so one of the re a real sort of, uh, it's really a part of the incredible tragedy of the, of the moment we are in, that it wasn't inevitable. We could have taken, the earth could have taken different turns, but one of the reasons they didn't is precisely this, because for one thing, they just assumed uh, that, you know, the world, uh, you know, 75% of the world is populated by brutes who will never figure out how to work these technologies. So this is just ours. Uh, the, uh, the other thing is uh, that, you know, fossil fuels just enriched many more people, uh, uh, rather enriched fewer people, fewer more powerful people. And that's what's behind uh, this, uh, this push for geo uh, solar geoengineering. I'm sure those people know that the consequences will ultimately be disastrous. But while it's happening, a few people will get very, very rich off it. You know, and that's what we are seeing increasingly with uh, all these so-called adaptive uh, technologies and patterns around us. Uh, Amitav, in the uh, 10 minutes or so we have, uh, we just want to invite uh, the audience uh, and you'd be happy to just take some comments, questions from them. Uh, um, so uh, we have a wonderful audience. I can see your names uh, here. Uh, so uh, please feel free to raise your hand, an electronic hand, and I can unmute you so you can ask your question directly. We'd love to hear from you. And thank you, Bruce uh, and Amitav, for that uh, astonishing conversation. We could, we could go on longer, and we hope we have other opportunities to hear both of you together.
Um, so if if you have uh, any questions, if not, we can continue talking. Um, I, I just like to say that, uh, you know, I had the great pleasure of uh, reading Bruce's uh, new book, uh, The Displacements, which is actually about uh, about climate change, all set against the background of climate change. I think, you know, to write a novel that's a climate change novel <laughs> is, to, uh, is an exercise in self-defeat. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> but, this is, uh, but Bruce's uh, book is actually uh, just wonderful. And, um, and uh, I think you. everyone would really love to read it. Oh, thank you so much. So we um, have a um, guest and I'm going to just let her um, talk. Can you, can you? Um... Yes, hello. Um, is that, is that me, Laura Walls? Yes, Laura, Laura. Okay, yes, good. Hi, thank you. Oh, uh, um, uh, Amitav, I'm, I'm so excited to hear you uh, speak. Uh, I know I heard a very much earlier version of this when you were here at Notre Dame some years ago. Um, oh, yes. Yeah, and I very much look forward to reading this book. Um, so I haven't really had time to formulate this question properly, but I've been uh, sort of half thinking about um, a lot of notions of ecological restoration in terms of rewilding. Uh, E.O. Wilson's, um, uh, you know, God rest his soul, uh, E.O. Wilson's concept of, of saving out a half earth that's become uh, influential in some environmental circles. Uh, we must set aside huge tracts uh, of the planet to let them rewild, or perhaps more pertinent to uh, exert some kind of, um, uh, yeah, uh, reverse terraforming that we can't just abandon these tracts. We need to get in and, and restore them or engineer, reintroduce species, um, you know, uh, maybe do some reverse genetic engineering to recover uh, lost species. I'm I'm wondering how this um, enters your thinking. What 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 you might say about? I mean, I I have great sympathy for uh, this this sense of of rewilding. At the same time, I'm not sure what I think about it. Um, I'd be interested to hear uh. your response. I think one has to be very careful with this idea of rewilding because, uh, you know, the way that some proponents of uh, rewilding approach the issue, I think would be actually disastrous uh, for indigenous peoples. It would be just, it's the survival international has just called it uh, the greatest land grab ever. Because, mm -hmm. you know, uh, indigenous peoples are just 17% of the earth's population, but they, are custodians of something like 75% of its uh, wild spaces. You know, at, uh, none of these spaces are in fact wild. You know, every, every environment on earth has evolved out of interactions with people. And the best possible custodians of these, uh, of these environments are indigenous peoples who've lived in them. And this, uh, there's, a, there's a kind of very exclusionary elitist conservationism uh, that goes back to the 19 well to the 19th century and to various kinds of racist ideas um, you know that were propagated by John Muir and many of the founders of uh, uh, American conservationism uh, who really regarded indigenous peoples uh, as uh, you know problems and they they yes. just wanted to shut them out of uh, you know what they thought was wild uh, you know wild environments uh, and Big Green, uh, even now, often takes those positions. So uh, I feel I, I, I feel uh, very divided about it because I, I I just don't. I mean, obviously, we want to uh, we want to preserve, uh, you know, environments of, of which are uh, unique and uh, different and so on. But I think we have to recognize that these environments didn't emerge. Uh, out of interactions only with animals, they they uh, emerged out of in, uh, interactions with the peoples who populated them, and yeah. their interests must also be protected. I think one of the hopeful signs is the interest in uh, using native uh, um, indigenous American forms of fire uh, uh, yes. to to yeah. Uh, so perhaps this is helping us recover that that uh, uh, long storied human use that has been so long silenced. If we can create that, then perhaps there's a future. Uh, yes, I do think that indigenous peoples should really take the lead in this. I mean, indigenous yeah. scientists, uh, in, you know, indige uh, uh, say with the fire technology, uh, 
uh, in California now, apparently, I mean, it's it's almost lost. There are only like three or four people who have any memory of, of how fire was once used. I mean, it just goes to show re really what, it, again, all these un unintended consequences of certain ways of thinking about the world. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you for your question. Thanks. While we wait for other hands, uh, Amitabh, I, I just wondered if you had, uh, um, you know, what, what do you thought of uh, a more kind of pragmatic approach of a suite of responses? Because there are certain kinds of technologies, if you think of carbon capture, I know they're, they're not, you know, in, in, in wider use, but some of the other, other kinds of, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just thinking of, uh, of, of, of the kind of intimate and agonistic relationship that modern humans have with technology and, and whether uh, a, a, you know, a whole scale abjuration of tech, I, I get your point about a mechanistic metaphysic. There's no, there's, I don't think we are dis, you know, anyone disputes that and the, and the sheer kind of uh, tragedy of the dominance of that worldview and, and, the, and the animus recoil from the planet as you write. But I just, I just uh, wonder how we, we can build, I guess, collaborative links across multiple constituencies that, that bring in different registers of solution thinking uh, about this, or uh, is, is your view generally that, that, that the technocentric point of view is catastrophic? I'm, I'm, just, I'm just kind of curious. Look, obviously there can be technologies that help and I hope uh, uh, that proves to be the case. But I think my, my issue with the technological way of thinking about uh, the planetary crisis is that it misunderstands the problem. Uh, the problem isn't with technology. Uh, the problem <laughs> is, with, is with human beings. I mean, it's fundamentally, uh, it's, this is fundamentally a conflictual process. It's a process of conflict. It's an undeclared war, uh, you know? And until we solve that problem, and until we solve the geopolitical issues, uh, there's no amount of technology that can uh, that, uh, that can be effective in this, you know. And again, let's not forget that energy transitions, in as much as they've happened in the past, have always been processes of incredible geopolitical conflict, you know. Yes. Uh, and uh, that's exactly what we are seeing today. You know, I mean, we are, I mean, in my book, I write about how the warm, you know. The way that countries, in fact, have prepared for climate change is by increasing their defense expenditure. They actually have been preparing for war, and that is perfectly clear now. We can see it. This war is erupting around us, and this war is probably not going to end. I mean, this is just the beginning. And, uh, you know, uh, so we talk about solutions and so on, but in fact, uh, these conflicts are actually the form that uh, this disaster is taking. Sure, and and one of the uh, richest, though it's it's a kind of a stark, ominous insight from your book, is how in all kinds of calculations about uh, global carbon emissions, especially the per capita, where it's then personalized uh, uh, per person, rather than that, these large uh, milit military infrastructure projects that are never factored into climate emissions, and yet they are among the largest emitters. Uh, as, as, as you well know, Pentagon is one of the largest emitters of carbon. It's the largest emitter. It's the largest, and it's never factored into this per capita global carbon uh, emissions at all. And so totally, uh, the, the, the point about uh, you know, us being, all of us uh, being prepared for just, just uh, a cataclysmic geopolitical uh, conflict. I think I think we are living through it, and we'll probably just adapt, learn to adapt to a world in perpetual conflict in some ways. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I mean, you know, it's very hard to. It's very very hard to. How shall I say? Uh, to be Pollyanna-ish at this moment, you know. Yes. Uh, there's uh, one just. Can't, I mean, a part of you just hopes, but another part is, has to look at this realistically, you know? Yes. 
And uh, there, there's a question that actually, uh, uh, there are two, two, we'll take these last two comments and questions, Amitav. Uh, they've, uh, they've been typed. One is by Renko Usami, who asks, what political solutions do you think are capable of being enacted? Do you think nonviolent methods will be enough? For example, there have been indigenous groups that take up strong armed or explicitly armed tactics in order to protect their autonomy and communities. Uh, and a second question, as a former uh, LA student, a resident from LA, I'm very familiar with the consequences of not having controlled burns. At this juncture, what do you see as the most productive way for the state of California to utilize this indigenous knowledge? And well, thank you, those are very good questions. questions. The first one, uh, let me say that, yes, it's true. I think uh, indigenous peoples are ab absolutely leading the way, uh, you know, whether it be from the no DAPL movement uh, to uh, the, uh, the Sami people uh, uh, in, in Norway, who actually managed to put an end uh, to the first uh, elite attempts uh, to create solar geoengineering. I mean, they just said no, uh, you know, because they understand, uh, you know, that it's, the technology promises a lot, but the unintended consequences are the things that you have to worry about, you know. So, uh, yes, I very much uh, think that the uh, indigenous peoples, there's so many great uh, leaders emerging from indigenous peoples around the world. Davi Kopenawa, for, uh, for example, Ailton Krenak uh, from, uh, from Brazil. They're very major figures, you know. I, I look to them, really. But I think there is another... There is another sort of point of hope from my point of view, which is that I think uh, vitalist movements and vitalist ideas are taking on uh, uh, an enormous importance across the world. I mean, uh, just look at the number of uh, uh, countries where, let's say, rivers and glaciers and mountains have actually been given personhood, uh, where the ideas of indigenous peoples regarding their sacredness uh, have been recognized. So I think that is absolutely a very, much a, a very much a good sign and it's very much a start. And it's also often possible that when these ideas really seize hold as they have now, especially amongst young people, there can be a massive change uh, in people's attitudes. Uh, Thank I you. Say, uh, yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. About Los to... Angeles, I really can't say, I mean, I'm not an expert on that on that subject. Well, thank you, Amitav. It's good to uh, end on a note of hope, and certainly the, the, the vitalism in a, in a long time. So let's hope we can continue to uh, converse across these various divides. Uh, and thank you again for joining us uh, at the University of Virginia at the Institute of Humanities and Global Cultures. It's always uh, wonderful to be able to. Uh, converse with you, to share ideas with you. And thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you.